semester of the ex famous experimentalness talk. And thank you for coming. And some people here do not usually come to these talks, so they may not be aware of the absolute axioms of this talk. There's absolutely no electronic devices, not taking notes, electronic notes. So all electronic devices should be safely stored and shut down. So you're welcome to have to leave. Uh, you don't have to stay. Right then, I disclaimer, this talk has nothing mathematically original, but it has lots of original meta-mathematics, philosophy. It's really a sermon against the narrow-mindedness of most mathematicians. They identify proof with truth. It's nice to have a proof of a mathematical theorem. It's sometimes very elegant, sometimes very rewarding. Other times it's very ugly. It's just a proof for the sake of having a proof. So it doesn't give you any insight. So a proof is a very nice art form. But usually, with few exceptions, it has nothing to do with the notion of truth. Because proofs are done by humans. And humans are notoriously unreliable. That's because a human found a proof and some referee checked it does not guarantee that it is correct. On the other hand, so many statements are obviously true. They are at least as true that the sun will rise tomorrow, that I have two hands, that E equals MC square, and other physical laws. And the two examples are the Riemann hypothesis and the P not equal to NP. And I'm still amazed that quite a few people, otherwise very, very smart people, claim at least that they have no idea that it's still open whether the Riemann hypothesis is true, and the, ju the jury is still out, and also about P not equal to NP versus P equals NP. So this, I, I hope that they're just joking or trying to be original, but maybe they do because for them they're so used that nothing is true until it's proven completely. Everybody is innocent until proven guilty that uh, they die to this. So another thing I want to dispel, most people think that the two big open problems in mathematics, the Riemann hypothesis in computer science, that P not equal to NP needs advanced mathematics. Usually the formulation uses at least advanced undergrade statements. In the case of the Riemann hypothesis, you have to define the certain complex function, uh, the so-called Riemann zeta function. So at least you have to know what it means, convergence, an infinite series, that's the first thing. And you have to know the p-test, that if s is bigger than 1, then it converges. You get some numbers. But then you have to know complex analysis, uh, you have to extend it, blah, 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 lots of advanced stuff, and then assuming you can extend it, you are, you are told that all the zeros, non-trivial zeros, are where the real part is one half. So it takes at least six years of intense studies to that understand the statement of the Riemann hypothesis. So the first thing I'm going to tell you, the well-known, but not as well-known as it should be, reformulation of the Riemann hypothesis in a way that a smart seven-year-old can understand. <laughs> And a stupid 10-year-old can understand. <laughs> this is the first challenge, reformulating the Riemann hypothesis in an easy to understand that only requires one notion, that of divisibility. And you can teach a five-year-old what it means for six to be divided by three. So you have six cookies, <laughs> so you can arrange them in lines, in the nice lines, so then a 6 is divided by 2. So if I tell a smart 4-year-old, if you have 6 
Uh, pennies, can you, and you have three, can you line them up in that? So that's a notion of an integer being divisible. Yes or no? So I can tell a five-year-old uh, is five pennies, can you line up five pennies into two lines, each of them containing, uh, sorry, into several lines, each of them containing two pennies. So you can try. No. So, so you can test whether something is invisible or not very, very easily. So then you can just tell them an exercise. Define the following sequence of numbers. You have to teach them about minus signs, but negative numbers, but that's okay, that's put it. If it's positive, put it here. If it's negative, put it here. And then, here's an algorithm. We find a sequence of numbers. F1 is zero. Sorry, F1 is one. Then, once you know A of two, blah, 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 A of M minus one, here's an, a way to figure out the next Entry in the sequence A of N. That's add up. A of 1. Oh, never mind. This to, in mathematical connotation, we can expand it to a 5 year old. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an algorithm to crank out a sequence of numbers. So let's do a few of them. Let's tabulate a few of them. A of 1 is 1, A of 2, uh, Karen, uh, what's the divisors of 2 that are properly divided? They're not 1, they're not 2. 1. Right, so minus. So A of 2 is minus 1. So what's the uh, art? What integers less than 3 are divisible by 3? 1. No, that's uh, art. Yeah. So minus three. So is also minus one. Thank you. What is the just less than four? I divided by four. One and two. Right. <laughs> so minus and uh, one plus minus one. A of four is zero. And so on. And you can in the programming exercise, you can crack out, crack out the first 10,000 terms very, very easily. If you notice, I have not mentioned any fancy thing, not even prime numbers. Prime numbers are already advanced. You have to then the prime decomposition and all this. <laughs> no, no prime numbers here. That's the very caveman's notion of divisibility and addition, and the advanced notion that you of minus sign. So you have minus, but otherwise. Now define a brand new sequence. Capital A of N. The function A of 1 plus A of 2. First, empirically, you can notice that the sequence always is either plus 1, 0, or minus 1. It's never something else. Exercise. Uh, to you, but for me, if you do it for the first 10,000 terms, you've got one, zero, or minus one, it's proof enough. So <laughs> it's narrow. And if you look at it, you form this, and if you write a computer program to write the first thing, you see that it doesn't go very, very. So here's an exercise for you. Prove that you call it maybe minus, it may be negative, to prove the absolute value for every n is less than n to the power 0 0.9999999 times exercise for you. If you can prove it, you'll be super famous. You won't get a million dollars, but you'll be super famous. You can, you can prove a slightly stronger statement that for any Epsilon bigger than zero, there is a constant C depending on epsilon, then you get the million dollar. That's the elementary, the most elementary statement I know of the Riemann hypothesis. I don't know. 
But this is only a statement. You don't get one million dollars for having a statement. You have to prove it. Here is a very plausible proof, which to me makes the Lima hypothesis obviously true. It's not a mathematical proof, but a mathematical proof, as I already said in the abstract, has nothing whatsoever to do with truth. It's just a game. When Neil Armstrong came, step on the moon, he did not prove that the moon existed. I knew the moon existed before Neil Armstrong. It was just a challenge, a technical challenge, to go to the moon. Let's look at the moon, and there was a lot of uh, evidence that the moon existed. When whoever did the Mount uh, Hillary, uh, Mount uh, Everest, 1953, he did not prove that Mount Everest existed. It was already obvious that the, it existed. So the truth of the existence of Mount Everest was not done by the people who climbed it first. They did a challenge, they got famous for meeting a challenge that nobody else can do. So the first person who proved the Lima hypothesis would be a sports hero, be an athlete. But he will not contribute any further knowledge to human knowledge, except as possibly a bonus. Some proofs give you insight, some proofs give proofs other things. It's possible that sometimes, I'm not saying it's not, it will be completely useless, it will only be, but possibly it will not be, that be a proof. But anyway, as far as the truth value of the Riemann hypothesis, it will not increase at all, because the proof also may be flawed, and uh, nobody knows. <laughs> so why am I so sure? So that's crank out this recurrence. For the first uh, 100, with maple I can literally do it 100 times. And discard the zeros. And then you look at the sequence. It's exactly like tossing a coin. It looks random. In my class, I thought about so-called random walks. And when you do it, you get done like this. So if you draw the sequences, one and minus one, the bunch of sums, you get exactly something resembling a so-called random motion. A random walk. And Einstein family says, God doesn't play with dice. I respectively disagree. <laughs> God does play with dice. But with a fair die. So when God decides who is to be a prime, who is to be... So uh, let me just tell you more advanced stuff. This is the more common name for A of N. is mu of N. It's a Mobius function, which could be defined as an exercise with... If it's square free, it's the product of distinct primes, it does uh, minus 1 to the power r, where it's the number of prime factors, and 0 otherwise. So when God decides whether an integer will have an even number of primes or an odd number of primes, it looks very, very, very random. Uh, yeah? You discard the zeros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they, but do they themselves behave randomly or they yeah, do? Yeah, they do also, they do so. Yeah. All right, in this case, sometimes, some days, you don't make any money. One day you make a dollar, some day you lose a dollar, and sometimes. So it even makes it slow. And, and we know that with a fair die, you can never get rich. If you toss a coin a million times, a fair coin, if you're lucky, you can get a thousand dollars. If you are unlucky, you lose a thousand dollars. If you even luckier, you can you have some positive chance of making five thousand dollars. If you're really unlucky, you have some chance of making a five thousand dollars. But there is no way unless you see that that you make two hundred thousand dollars. So it's a Elementary theorem in probability theory, if you toss a coin n times, uh, it's roughly some, the standard deviation is spelled of n, so it's plus or minus, what you can have, you can hope to win. And if you do it a, a zillion times, then uh, it's always like this. And in fact, some relatively stupid 19th century mathematician called Mertens, Otherwise, they smart, but they made a stupid conjecture. He thought that it's even better than random. And indeed, if you just do the first 
at 10,000 towns, it's even fizzier. Not only the hope of making $2,000 is no way. So this statement, A of N, which is your gain in playing this prime game, he conjectured that it's exactly and about 20 years ago, Andrew and Lisko, in a beautiful paper, a numerical algorithm, but also using a lot of uh, insight, disproved it. If you, go, if you go far enough, it's true for many, 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 many n. But if you go far enough to 10 to the power, I don't know, 10, eventually he, it, it succeeds it. By a little bit. I think it's still open, but it's this. My guess is, this is also, uh, also false. <laughs> Because if you go far enough, but <laughs> this is certainly true. Because it's, uh, it's it cannot be better than gambling. So this is the game hypothesis. So this is the heuristic proof that the game hypothesis is indeed true in a single way convincing. The other one is and also due to Andro Disco. Also Andro Disco being a traditional mathematician does not admit that it's a proof. He says he only calls it numerical evidence. So going back to the Riemann zeta function, you can do blah 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 blah. And he found the first million or even built ten million zeros. And they all like on the so-called critical, uh, critical Line, principle line. If something is true for 10 million cases, it is true forever after. And many times, when the table come up with stupid counter example, there's always a wise guy who says, hey, ha ha, here's an example of something that is only true. Because all the examples that come up are artificial. <laughs> Any natural example, if it's true for the first 10 million cases, it's true forever after. For equality! Not inequality, I agree. For inequalities, you cannot jump to conclusions. For example, let's let look at the following inequality. X is bigger or equal to... Uh, X, yeah, X is smaller or equal to 10 to the, to the Google. It's true for x equals 1, it's true for x equals 2, it's true for x equals 3, and it must true. Of course, this is flawed, because inequalities, this inductive reasoning does not apply to inequalities. But to equalities, it sure does. And there are so many examples that I can come up of classes of functions that a priori, if you know that they are true for so many cases, they are true forever after. I call it the N0 principle. The most simple example are polynomials of degree D. If two polynomials of degree D are equal for D plus one different places, then they are identically equal by simple linear algebra. But the other much more sophisticated classes of functions for which it is true. They exist in a priori, easy to, to find. A uh, constant n0, usually relatively small. So if you check it for the first n0 cases, it's true rigorously forever after. And there are many cases for which it was not known before. And uh, one example I discovered, the so-called binomial coefficients, a uh, hyperdomestic series, for which all these people tried very hard and they did the first 10 cases and then they didn't know they had a proof. But in hindsight, once this general meta principle was proven, then it followed that it's enough to check it to find in many cases. Another example I found in 1990. Oh, oh yeah, a uh, yeah, very stupid thing. In the course, it's a diving into mathematical proof that I hate. Uh, they taught the students to prove by induction, first of all. So if you prove, if you check it for 0, 1, and 2, it's completely equals proof. A little bit less evenly. And if I'm not identity, 
This is the casino identity. If you check it for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, it's QED. Complete the rigorous proofs. There's a meta theorem that any probability identity of a certain type, if you check it for sufficiently many special cases, not that many, you have a complete rigorous proof. And this came much later than this. So I'm sure that very soon there'll be a meta principle that the Riemann zeta function belongs to a class of functions that if you check the zeros, the identity real of the zero, the first n zero zero is, is, is a constant, but half is true for every after. I'm sure it's yet to be found, but I'm sure it exists. So then. And I'm sure the N0 would be much, much less than 10 million that the disco found. Probably be 50 or 60, maybe even 10. So, this is my heuristic proof of the Riemann hypothesis. Now let's go to the other big timer. The most important theorem in computer science. I call it theorem, but most people call it conjecture or problem. No, most people call it problem. Because I don't know if P is not equal to NP or P equals NP. Once again, the user formulation is you have to find a Turing machine, which is a very boring thing. And then complexity classes, blah blah blah. <laughs> this is a much better way of formulating it to a kid. Many puzzles for children is you are given a graph. Is, can, you, can you trace it without any repeating any edge twice? We all know this is called the Eulerian problem. And famously Euler found a very quick way to decide whether it's possible or not. That look is the degree, the number of neighbors. If they're all even, then so it's very easy to decide. But an analogous problem for the child to, if you call it cities, and you want to, can you, can you find a path that visits every city exactly once? Or come back to this. This is called the Hamiltonian. So colloquially, the P not equal to NP problem can be said. If I give you a random graph, so I take a random graph with 1,000 vertices and 1,000 vertices. There is no way, way of finding out quickly whether you can do it or not. So, it, of course, there's always a naive way of doing it. You have n cities, there are n factorial ways of arranging them. You try every which way and see if you can every or which way, each of them can you go through the edges and see. But this takes a long time. But see, this is still not very precise. Now let me make it completely precise using Boolean circuits. And then also, don't get scared, it has an advanced sound to it, but it's very, very elementary, and you can explain it to a smart five-year-old. In logic, George Bull said, you have three fundamental operations. X or Y, X or Y, X and Y, and x and not x. So this is the fundamental Boolean functions. And you can have a truth table. If x is false and y is false, then x or y is also false. So this is the fundamental Boolean functions. And then the truth table for n 
if that, of course, then it is x and y, of course, if they are both false, it's false. If one of them is false, it's also false. So that's a true statement for this. And for not x, so that's all you need to know. And now you can have a component. These three components can design many more complicated Boolean functions with many, many gates. So X and Y are called input gates. So let's have an example of a Boolean circuit. It's really a very simple concept. So these are the fundamental components. You go to the storeroom. So you write X, you have the input gates, and then you write it like this for an OR gate. And for an AND gate, there's an AND gate. And the convention is that the negation gates do not cost, do not cost any money. Since the negation gates do not cost any money, it's more convenient not to use this, but to use the 10 fundamental Boolean functions of two variables. So instead of having components, this, this, and this, and or a gate, you have 10 gates. Is that the matter of convenience? Since negation is free. So you have this, 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 and this. So, uh, so this is uh, or one, or two, or three, or four. And then you have or five is x, and, uh, and then by the Morgan, uh, they are equivalent. And then, yeah, so this is, this is called the O, o type, that's called the N type. And you have also the, ex, uh, the exclusive all and its negation. So you have 10 fundamental components that the factory of good and circuits manufactures. So this, you can don't need negation anymore. Label, let's call it C1 to C10. So now you can build, you can have fun, and you can build, lots, you can implement lots of Boolean functions, completely at random. So for example, so you have X, Y, and Z, the first generation, which then you can take this, using, for example, X, C2, as I'm making up. So this is the first generation, so that's C3. And it's okay to, <laughs> to have incest, <laughs> and, and have this, and so on. So you can make up lots of things, lots of Boolean functions, and if you compute it, at the end of the day, this is called the output gate. And the output gate is some true or false. And if you try out for zero, 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 true, false, 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 true, etc., for each combination of inputs, you get one output, and you can construct the truth table. And vice versa. As you probably know, every Boolean function with n variables is given by its truth tables. So you write zero, for example, zero, 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 false, 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 one. And then you write if it's this. And another easy lemma is any Boolean function can be written in so-called complete disjunctive normal form. Easy. From the truth table, you can write down a nice explicit quote-unquote expression. For example, you look x1, alpha1, x2, alpha2, xn, alpha n. With the alphas, I use the zeros and one. Eh, sorry, a one on negation. And the way you do it, you look at those that have one in them, it's exercise for you. For example, an example, if everything is zero, but only this is one, 